And we are live on social media. Hello, everyone out there in social media land. Let me see if I can move you off to the side. I'm I'm running with one video camera, one camera today, which may not seem like all that big of a deal, but I have been running with multiple screens for a long time and to figure out how to do it with very few screens or simply moving it down to one screen is what we call a challenge. But here we go. Nonetheless, we're ready to go. We're going to give it a try. We'll see how it goes. Let me turn off my phone. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Put a little airplane mode going on here. Coffee, it's 101. We're going to be live here very soon. Hopefully, it's not too much of an echo. Oh, you know what, India? I'm not going to turn off my cell phone because it's the only way I can text you. So if you text me back, India, just let me know that I sound okay. That would be pretty fantastic if you did that for me. Because <clears throat> I do feel like I have a little bit of an echo in this room, but I don't know as much I can do about it. Let me go. You can turn the standard banner on. Oh, sheesh, sheesh, Luis. Oh, oops, banner. Hopefully that's the one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that the one, India? I hope so. Because that's the one you're getting. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Ralph Peterson radio program. I am your host, of course. Lovely to be here. I am Ralph Peterson. In case you have not seen the face or maybe you haven't heard the voice, Depends on if you're watching live on Facebook or Twitter or YouTube or if you're just listening. Here we go. It is, what day is today? It is the 16th of February. I am all discombobulated. You know, the holiday, the day after President's Day, I don't know about you. It's always the worst day for me. I mean, everybody parties hard. It has the biggest holiday when it's President's, of course, I'm being facetious. President's holiday came and gone. Here we are. It's Tuesday the 16th of February, 2021, and we are raring to go. Welcome to the Ralph Peterson program, and thank you so much for joining us. We are brought to you by the IBGR, IBGR Network. By the way, I want to put out right from the beginning how valuable, how amazing it is to have the IBGR radio on the go. If you have not downloaded the app, the IBGR app, I really recommend it. It is one of the greatest things where you can take this radio program and others like it that is put out by IBGR and listen while you are shoveling your driveway. I know if you're anything like me, I'm in upstate New York this week and there is a ton of snow and it's still coming, still coming down. And I'm sure I, you see everywhere. I saw a news clipping that Walmart closed six or seven of their stores due to the, the to, due to the, the storm coming. And I was like, when Walmart closes due to the storm, you know there's a problem because when a storm is coming, where do you go? You go to Walmart to get your supplies. But Walmart's closing due to the storm. You know that's some heavy storms all across the United States. So IBGR.network, go to IBGR in your app store, whether it's your iPhone or your Android, and you can get a copy of the, of the, the IBGR radio app, which is just fantastic. And... What we're going to be talking about today, other than that, is all about this whole concept of work processes. As you know, IBGR is a business radio. This program is all about entrepreneurs helping entrepreneurs, business owners helping business owners understand business. And here on the Ralph Peterson program, we are all about trying to break down the operation side of business. And when you're talking about operations and you're talking about business, you have to have a real good, solid conversation about your work processes, how you do whatever it is you do. And you know what's fun is I said this last week, I've been saying this for a while, 
when you understand business, you kind of can see it in all things. And one, I was talking to some friends who have some young teenagers in their group and they were talking about, we're talking about the radio show and talking about this. We're going to be talking about work processes. And one of these, this young man just could not understand what I was talking about, about work process. Like what is a work process? And so I said, did you hear about, maybe you heard about this. There was a young lady, I think actually a couple of people who decided that they were going to change the Hollywood sign in Hollywood. It's no longer going to say Hollywood. They're going to change the last word. So it was Holly something else. And they did change it. They got caught. They got arrested. The whole thing is on social media. I think it was like this whole big social media event. This kind of like little stunt trying to be funny and cute for your TikTok or whatever it is. But I said, now you think about it. They were only up there for 30 minutes. That means they've had to have all kinds of meetings prior to that 30 minute little escapade where they broke down the work process that they were going to do when they got on top of that mountain. As a matter of fact, not just getting on top of the mountain, but getting to the mountain and then getting up the mountain, bringing supplies up to the mountain and who was going to be where, who is going to be the lookout, who is going to be carrying this letter, who's going to be carrying that letter, how they're going to strap it to the existing letters, how they're going to get them up to the sign, who's going to make the letters. I mean, the entire process could be written out as a beautiful work process. Obviously, it was a bonehead thing to do to go up and that's why they got arrested because they're defacing property, blah, blah, blah. But when you're talking to a teenager and they're trying to figure out what a work process is, this is a great example. I said, you watch this girl or these girls or whoever it was. The only picture I saw was of a young lady, teenage looking girl being arrested. So that's why I keep saying girl. I don't, I'm sure there was more than one because the, the letters that she was replacing were humongous. They had to be like 15 foot letters. So I'm sure she had a crew with her. But if you think about all the steps that it took, from plan to creation to actually implementing, bringing all the supplies up to the mountain and bring, that is a work process. And if you were interested in recreating what they were able to do, what you would do is you would go, okay, you made the plan, you executed the plan. Now let's break it down again and say, where could we have done better? Where could we have, where could we have saved time, saved money, been a little more efficient? Could we have been there? Could we, 30 minutes, the police were there and they were arrested. Could they do it in 20 minutes? Could they break their time down? You ever seen those, you ever seen those, those police shows where the bank robber goes in and they, they, once they walk in the door, they start their watch, you know, 30 seconds. That is a work process. That is somebody who has studied the bank, studied the situation, looked at all the steps it would take. One of my favorite shows in the entire world is Groundhog Day with Bill Murray. I absolutely can't get enough of that movie. And there is a spot in that movie where he steals money from the back of a armed armored vehicle. And when you see him do it, he counts. He's like one there's a gust of wind, two, a dog barks, three, kids playing, four, drop quarters, five, grab the bat. Right? Like he has it all planned out because he has studied it over and over and over again. And he understood the work process and he understood where the weakness in the work process was. And he was able to exploit that work process. I think it's such a fun way of looking at how you do those kinds of things. I think it's super fun. And <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it just reiterates one of those key elements that when you're talking about work processes is not a big thing. Some people hear the word work process, the turn of phrase work process, and they think we're going to be talking about something super heavy. We're not talking about something super heavy. We're talking about how it is you do, you provide your service or how you provide your product, create your product. How do you do customer relations? How do you handle complaints? How do you get to work in the morning? How do you make sure everybody clocks in on time? How do you buy a book? How do you buy groceries? All of these, all of these are tiny miniature snapshot work processes that are evaluated and evaluated and evaluated so that the company that's providing these services and these products do so faster and faster and faster. I remember Grant Cardone, who is like this, this motivational speaker, and he's actually very well known for teaching people how to sell. And now he's even getting more, more well known for learning, teaching people how to buy, how to buy 
real estate, which is an interesting thing. He goes from being the guy who you go to learn how to sell. And now he's the guy teaching you how to buy, but that's him. One of the problems that he had and it's such a, I'm talking, I'm going to tell you the problem that he was facing when he was doing seminars. And I'm going to tell you before I tell you what it was, I wish I could only dream. And I'm sure I'm not alone that I could have the problem that he had. And here's the problem. The lines were too long for people to buy a book of his. And so rather than waiting in line, he would lose, he estimated, between 20 and 30% of his audience would not stick around to buy the book because it took too long to stand in line, to get a book, to buy the book, to stand in line, to get a picture with him. Everybody wanted to do it, but nobody wanted to do it at the expense of staying for hours after an event. And so he had to come up with a way to get people to buy the book faster than what was happening because the pictures were not the drag. The drag was getting people to buy the book fast because of the sliding the credit cards and the, the credit card app and you know, the app doesn't work. So you have to manually put it in the phone. And how many people can you actually be doing that? How many people are going to be running a little mini cash registers for you before your system starts breaking down? And that is where he started to get really into the technical side of QR codes and being able to figure out ways to make it so that people could buy his book like that, like a snap of a finger, that super fast, very little, low drag, low, low consequence in buying. And that is, again, a work. He simply saw an issue with his work process and all right, how do we, how do we currently get people to buy the book? What's the physical steps they take to buy the book? And what can we do to make sure that we can get it faster and smarter and, and more efficient so that people can, will stick around and they will meet me. They will get their picture taken with me. They will let me sign their book because it, we just took away so many minutes or hours or however the, the headache that it was to buy a Grant Cardone book at a Grant Cardone event is no longer challenging. I went to a Jocko Willink event recently. And I got to tell you what, Jocko's got it all figured out. He gives you the copy of the book when you walk in the door. There is no buying. He's already, you've already purchased a book. <laughs> so he, he takes away the guesswork easy. And here's the best part about doing this. It's so super smart on Jocko Willink's part. When he gives you a free book, potentially a free book, obviously it's in the price of the ticket, but he gives you a free book when you walk in the door and then you, he says that he will sign them at the end. How many people do you think stays in the end and has him sign their book? That's right. Nearly everyone. Because you, it's one thing when you don't have the book and you haven't, weren't able to get the book or what are you going to do? Go stand there in front of him and you couldn't get the book because it was taking too long to buy it. No, you're not going to wait. But if you already have the book, everybody's going to stay. Everybody's going to get their picture taken. Then all of a sudden you have a thousand people with their picture and you, with you in it. And they're, they're putting on social media I, a thousand times. I was with Jocko Willink. I was look at the book, look at the book, look at the book. Not one person in the world history could ever have to read that book. And he is selling thousands of books just by giving the book away, which means people stay and have their picture taken. It's just a work process assessment that he was able to do and figure out. And that's what we're going to be talking about on today's program. More on work processes and maybe a little more on Jocko Willing. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to talk about next in about 15 seconds. No, here we go. Ready to go. 15 seconds. I meant two and a half minutes, dumbass. Okay. Hold on. Again, I'm not good with this. Okay. Good, good, good. Um, audio only on radio. Okay, I got it, Bill. I got it. I sound distorted. Uh, India, do I sound distorted still? The video is blurry. Can you turn the standard band? Okay, India, am I still sounding? Do I sound any better? Talking to Bill there, India. Uh, I can hear great, but video is blurry. Okay. Well, you said that before. India, tell me if um, how I'm doing here. 114, 117 and a half.
Oh, good. Thank you, India. So I'm sounding good on India's end, which is good. I'm going to guess and assume that means um, uh, true, true. Bill says it is good, except uh, maybe I'm always distorted, a little naturally distortion going on. That's true. That could be a thing. Who knows? I have so many things to talk about today. It's going to be so much. There's so much going on in the news. It's crazy. And it's six people. I, so there were six people who were arrested in charge with the holiday sign that read Holly Boob. I didn't want to say it on the air, but I'll say it to you, Facebook land. Holly Boob was what the word they changed it to, which sounds, well, just as stupid as I guess it was supposed to sound. Mm-hmm. There's such so much fun stories out there. Okay. Yeah, I got it, Bill. Everybody to Facebook. Pronto. Pronto. Oh, pronto. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ralph Peterson Radio Program brought to you by IBGR.network. As a matter of fact, our main sponsor, I should, I, I forgot to mention in the top of the hour, but it is, we are officially being brought to you by the Standard Health and Rehab, the number one training site for housekeeping managers in long-term care. However, I got to tell you that we've been talking an awful lot about work processes and I got to this is where I make all my money. I'm not going to BS anybody. This is where I make all my money. I teach people how to get better, more efficient, more effective in their work processes. Of course, I work in housekeeping, but it could be anything. It could be lawn mowing. It could be, it could be trucking. Speaking of trucking, there is a huge development, <laughs> huge development in the world of trucking that I don't know a lot of people are talking about. And that is trucking, the, the pandemic has changed the trucking industry in a way that was quite unexpected. It's almost like skinny jeans coming back into, into, into fashion or remember those jean mini skirts and, and then, you know, they, they were out of fashion and all of a sudden they came fashionable again. That's what happened. <laughs> that is what is happening in trucking, trucking for a long time. Prior to maybe 30, 40 years ago, trucking was, you know, the, the trucking industry itself wasn't as sophisticated as it is today. And today you are able to, trucking companies are able to run mute, multiple trailers in tandem, meaning, <coughs> excuse me, one truck driver could take two truckloads, <coughs> tractor trailer loads of goods at one time. And when this first started happening, it was, I mean, it made the news for the, for, because of, not because of its industrial revolution. It's not for, because they're able to do more with less. No, because of the amount of jobs that you are losing, trucking jobs, lost a lot of trucking jobs due to the ability of truck drivers, one truck driver being able to take multiple being able to take multiple trailers with them at one time reduces the amount of jobs that they have for truck drivers, of course. Well, now, fast forward 2021, the pandemic comes, truck drivers are not only more than essential at this point. I mean, everybody's ordering goods. Everybody is ordering goods from, from I have a dog in the background, by the way, he might have saw a deer. So just don't mind him. He's doing dog things. 
with the pandemic, everybody is staying home, staying in one place, and they're ordering a ton more goods and goods. And they all have to come either through planes, through trains, or through trucks. And here's the problem with trucks, however. These trucks have gotten so massive and so big and so high tech that they need large warehouses to deliver to. Well, guess what? Large warehouses, these large break-in books, are no longer being able to keep up. Now, what these truck companies are finding is they need to go back to smaller trucks, individual size trucks, and deliver to smaller houses or smaller fact workshops or um warehouses, smaller warehouses more often. And so there, uh, there's a big need. If you're looking for work, my friend, there is a big need for people with CDLs, people who can drive trucks because there is such a huge demand both for more truck drivers to be driving and more goods to be driven, delivered in smaller quantities and smaller batches more often. It is, it is quite an interesting turn of events where, you know, it, it was at one time we were trying to get bigger, 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 delivering to these large warehouses. And now with the pandemic and, and all these smaller shops, these smaller warehouses taken over and these large trucks can't even accommodate, can't even pull in, can't even pull up to these places. Smaller trucks are winning the day. And there's a lot, there's a lot of movie. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, stories out there about these truck, these trucking companies like Old Dominion, Dominion and and Airbest and Saya, they these are big, big, the largest trucking companies in the United States, and they are on board. They are leading the charge with reducing the amount of tandem tractor trailers they use and going to these smaller single bed trailers so that they can get in and deliver more often to these to these warehouses. It's quite interesting when you start looking at work processes and how other people in other industries are affecting each other. There's this one news story. There's this one news story. I'm going to go put a muzzle on that DOG here in a minute. There's another story that I think is just so, it's so right up my alley when it comes to work processes and how other people see other people's work processes and they're able to upgrade them. That is, by the way, that is how new businesses and growth happens organically. It's when you go and you get a product or a service from somebody and you get kind of what you want, but you can see a way to improve what they're doing. And you're like, you know, if I owned that kind of a company, I would do it like this, or I would do it like that. And somebody else says, you know, that's a pretty good idea. I bet if you did that, we can make some money doing that. And all of a sudden you have this offshoot company that's attempting to provide similar services that somebody else is doing, but they're doing it in a whole new unique way. I think it's really fun and really industrious of people. And that of course is right up my alley with business operations. And there's this guy, this guy, what is his name? Huge, huge Ma. He, all right. So his name is huge Ma H U G E. And his last name is M A. So I, do what you will with that name. I'm sure it's huge. Ma. He was a software engineer for Airbnb, really super smart guy. And he lives here in New York City and he is trying to get his mom a, a appointment for the coronavirus vaccine. And he cannot do it. He says that there's three websites. All of them are super clunky. All of them are super weird. They all have these different expectations, different forms, different requirements. They're all put out by the city of New York City. They're all confusing. <coughs> and they cost millions of dollars to create. And here comes this young guy. He's, again, 31-year-old software engineer. And for $50, I just want you to pay attention to this. For 50 bucks, he spent 50 bucks creating a website that cataloged all three other websites. And he did so, and he did so with the idea that he could, that he could create one single website better than the three websites that are out there. And it turns out he was right. He was able to take all three websites and make one website out of the three where he could, he, all the things that are required are on one page for all three sites. It makes it super streamlined. You have placeholders, $50. The government goes out and makes three websites. You can't make any heads or tails about them. You can't figure out what the heck you're supposed to be doing on them. They're clunky. They don't work. Millions of dollars. 
This young entrepreneur, 31 years old, goes out 50 bucks in a couple of weeks of free time, and he's able to create one website that brings all three of these websites together. I think it is super, super, super important to understand that is how we look at work processes. You take, you break them apart, you tear them down, and you figure out how to get them better and better and better. And then, you know, don't even get me started about government waste. And there's this, <laughs> speaking of the government, this is just, it's too funny to me not to bring up. And it's just this, let me read the, let me read the tagline for you. Former manager of the Department of Defense Aerospace Threat Program. I love that the Department of Defense has an aerospace threat program. Anyway, the aerospace threat program says UFOs are real. Now, the reason I think that is super funny is not because of the idea that this high ranking official has said, oh my God, aliens are real, because that is not what this guy said. You know what this guy said? This guy said, you know, there's a lot of things we can't identify, right? UFOs, unidentified flying objects. There, there are some things we see in the sky. We have no idea what they are. Oh, okay. What the heck does that mean? That doesn't mean anything. It just means that you can't identify some things. I don't know. A lot of people read into that and they'll say, oh, that means there's UFOs. It may just simply mean that this guy doesn't know what something is. I remember there's this great story about the about the American pilots, American Air Force, able to get a MiG. And this MiG is a Russian-made jet that was super weird looking, especially back in the 1950s, 1960s. This thing, or 60s, maybe early 70s. I'm not, I don't remember quite exactly when they were made, but... This, this this MIG, this thing, looked way weird. It looked extraterrestrial. I mean, this if you, you just go look up a MIG aircraft, you'll see it looks nothing like anything else. And the American government had one in Nevada, and they were flying it, test flying it all over the place. And people would see this thing, and they would report that they saw a UFO. Of course they saw a UFO. They saw something they've never seen before. It was an unidentified flying object. And then we got this brains, brainstormer over here, former manager of the DOD aerospace, says that there are a lot of things in the air that he can't explain. Good. Thank you for that story. Thank you for that news line. <laughs> Maybe I take things too far. Who knows? Maybe I take things too far. You know what? Actually, there's speaking of taking things too far, England, I don't know if you heard about this, but England has created what they're calling COVID hotels. What are they actually calling it? They're, oh, they're calling it the British Quarantine Hotels. The British Quarantine Hotels. And this is what's happening to you. If you want to go to England, if you want to go to Britain, you're met off the, off the airplane by armed security guards who escort you to a bus and then escort you to a hotel and then they make you stay in the hotel for 10 days. Now, now we're, talking, we're not talking about a luxury hotel. We're not talking about a place where it's just a vacation of your lifetime. We're talking about four rooms in absolute boredom in a country you just got to for 10 days because they don't want people to be spreading the coronavirus. It is, it's quite amazing. I'm actually happy to see on the stupid sense, I'm happy to see they're actually using them because during World War II, Britain built a ton of these bunkers, fallout bunkers, and they never used them. But we'll maybe we'll talk about that on the other side of this small little break. Maybe not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I still got to talk to people about getting on my Facebook page. I remember, I will. <clears throat> if you're on my Facebook page, thank you for being there. If you are not on my Facebook page, get there because you need to be on the Facebook page for, uh, I think actually it's the best place to listen. It's the best place to watch. I think that's really um, what uh, Bill is trying to say. It is the best place to watch. I need to see that scrolling number right there. 3129. I'm not going to bring it back up on the air, but let me just finish my little quick story about the quarantine hotels in Britain. During World War II, they were expecting this huge bombardment in, from Nazi German airplanes. They were already getting huge bombardments, but they thought that people were going to go stir crazy. Like they were not going to be able to handle the constant onslaught 
of barragement, of bombing from the Germans. And so they literally built these humongous, very sturdy, windowless buildings, like these huge window, window, windowless brick buildings, concrete and steel, way out in the countryside. And they were designed to be massive bunkers, above ground bunkers, by the way, massive bunkers where people could go because they were going to be scared because they would nobody would want to stay in the city. And it turns out that the, the, the bombing came, the Germans came, they leveled half the city and not one person ever wanted to leave the city. Not one per, not one British person, not one English person, English men, English woman ever wanted to leave the city, especially and go to this, hang out in these, these bomb shelter type things. So it's, Britain's quite famous for building things that they think their citizens are going to want to need, and then they don't use them. But of course, with the, the quarantine hotels, you're being escorted with armed guards. You don't have a choice. That sounds, that sounds absolutely lovely. First guest it just arrived on Monday as the government tries to prevent new coronavirus variants from derailing its fast moving vaccination drive that has delivered more than 15 million shots in 10 weeks. Da, 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 da. Oh, Yvette, could you imagine getting to England and then your vacation's only five days, but you have to spend 10 days in this terrible hotel before you can even get out, before you can enjoy your five days? How do you explain that to your boss? I needed, uh, I need three weeks off just so I can spend. So I can help have one week off. I don't know. Something like that. Sounds quite ridiculous to me as well. <clears throat> All right. We will get rid of that story. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ralph Peterson radio program where we are talking about work processes today, how it is that you break work processes down. How do you get better at providing services, providing goods to your customers? When I was a young man, one of my first first jobs working in a factory, I worked for this place called Capital Candy. Capital Candy, and it was a it was a traditional break and bulk where they got delivered, you know, cases and cases of food, and then they would they would sell these they break these back these boxes of food up, and they would sell them to grocery stores. And so it was a retail, a business to business retail center for grocery stores. <clears throat> little mom and pop grocery stores and that kind of thing. And I remember the the owner of the company was a guy named George Burns, which I thought was funny at the time because I was only 16 and this was in 1986, 1987. And George Burns at the time was actually a pretty famous comedian. He was like in his eighties or something. So he was very old, but it was the first time I'd ever met somebody who was named after, who was named, had the same name as somebody famous. And I was like, George Burns, well, isn't that odd? Of course, it's not odd. But when you're 16, you know, something like that makes you exciting. Anyway, I remember I hadn't been working there very long. My mom worked there. So my mom worked in the cigarette department. They had an entire cigarette department. They had a frozen food department. They had a candy department. They had, you know, all these kind of departments. And I was working, the, the George Burns came along and he was asking all of us to write our own job routine. And I had no idea what he was talking about, but apparently what he wanted to know, he said, I want you to write down everything you do in a day. Now I got to tell you, when I first heard this, I thought that he was trying to make me admit that I didn't do enough during the day. Like I didn't have, I shouldn't have had the job. Like I was just always just walking around, not doing anything with my hands in my pocket. That's what I thought he was getting after. It turns out what he was really trying to figure out was he was trying to figure out how many employees he had and what they were doing. And he was trying to make some semblance of job routines because at the time he just simply didn't have a good firm grasp on what the expect, what he should be expecting from his employees. Like you start here, then you go here, then you go here, the order comes in here and then it comes to this person and how many orders can they take a day? And it probably depends on how many 
items are on each order. Then how do they bag these orders? And they have to walk around the warehouse to get, and that's what I was. I was like a collector. I think they actually called me a runner. So as a runner, what I would do, because I, and, and as silly as this sounds, but again, I didn't want to get in trouble. When he said, write down what you do every day, I wrote down, hi, my name is Ralph Peterson and I do everything that Karen tells me. And that was literally what I thought was a good answer from what I did all day because I worked for a lady named Karen and she stood at a bench. She took the orders and she would write down on a piece of paper all the things she needed me to go get. And the, the warehouse was humongous. So it wasn't like she could just go get them herself. That's why she had a runner, me, a little 16 year old kid. And that's why a lot of these packers, these people had runners working for them and we would be running all over the warehouse with little shopping carts or we didn't have shopping carts. We actually had baskets and we were just, I would literally go shop. I would go get spices. I would go get potato chips. I would go get ring dings. I would go get candy. I would go get cigarettes. I would get all these things and bring them back to her and she would pack them up into boxes. Then she would label the boxes and then we, she'd put them on these carts and we'd take the carts to the back warehouse part where the trucks were. And then we would load them onto trucks and then the truck drivers would take them and they would go deliver them. Now, what I just told you was their entire work process. We would get an order comes in. She would look at the order. She'd write down half the things that she needed me to go get. The other half she would go get because they were around her workstation. She, we'd get them. She'd check off the list, everything that she had. If there was something that we didn't have, which was often a little sidebar story, which is kind of fun is we would often not have like a tiny thing. Like they wanted cinnamon. So they wanted a, again, this is a business to business. So the retail, the store was asking for small, small containers of cinnamon that they could sell on their shelf. We would be out of cinnamon. And so Karen would say to me, she'd say, grab an allspice. And I'd be like, what's an allspice? She's like, this allspice is, it's just the same, looks the same. It just says allspice, not cinnamon. I'm like, okay. So I'd go and I <clears throat> replace the cinnamon with allspice. And she would just make a little check saying that allspice was given for instead of cinnamon because we're out of cinnamon. But that's the work process. And then what would happen? So because I was, I worked there for a little bit and I would, I would, I was the type of kid who I had so much energy that you, you couldn't hold me down even if you had a couple of ropes. And so I'd be always willing to do anything like oh, you, 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 they need me to do, do something, go take down this or go, go clean out that or go sweep the shop room. I would do anything. I loved being around the workshop. I love being around people. I love how massive it was. It was fun. And there was one time they said, Hey, you have your driver's license. I said, I do. They're like, how about going out and making a couple of deliveries for us? I was like, heck yeah. Well, here I am making my first debut a delivery driver as a Capital Candy employee. Got the Capital Candy van, it says Capital Candy on it. I drive to the first place where I'm going. It's this store. And the late, I'm, I'm giving, I'm like, here's your box. I'll see you later. She's like, nah, nah, nah. you don't drop your box off and run away. Get back in here. I want to go through and make sure everything is here. And we get to the allspice and it wasn't cinnamon. It was allspice. And she berated me. She gave me the biggest lecture about how cinnamon is not all spices and cinnamon. And she was getting this directly for a customer and how terrible it was. Did you think I would take all spice over cinnamon? Have you ever made this? Have you ever made that customer engagement? Blah, blah, blah. She was just so mad that we had given her all spice instead of cinnamon. Oh, in fact, I, and you know, here I am again, I'm 16. I don't even know what all spice is. I'm barely lucky. I know what cinnamon is. So I'm like totally lost. I was like, well, Karen told me that this was, I, we didn't have, and I'm not sure when it's going to be. And I'm not, I don't know. <laughs> she was pissed. And I remember going back and I was like, I have got the story forever to tell you guys about this lady and how she was mad because we gave her all spice and you, she wanted cinnamon. And they were totally like, yeah, that happens all the time. I'm like, it does. Like we're pissing off customers all the time. They're like all the time. What are, you know? And Back in 1986, 1987, you know, it just wasn't as easy to communicate with. Imagine if, <clears throat> imagine if a hundred customers all asked for cinnamon and you only had 30 pieces of, you know, 30 containers of cinnamon. Are you going to call 70 clients saying you don't have cinnamon? Which, which alternative would you like? And then, I mean, think of, you, you couldn't, it, it would be too much at that point. Whereas nowadays, with the internet and online ordering and able to be able to, to go in and make changes on the fly in that instant communication. I can send everybody a text or an email. Hey, we're out of this. 
Would you like an alternative kind of thing? You couldn't do that in 1987 so so easily. And again, this is one of those work processes that we look at in retrospect and go, okay, how can we make this better? How, how can we, how can we serve the client better? And at the time, giving them an alternate that I still don't even know if all spice is the actual spice that we gave. I think it was all spice, something like that. It was something that was pretty similar. I mean, it wasn't like she ordered cinnamon and as a replacement, we gave her a pair of shoes. You know, it wasn't like it was so far fetched. She treated it like it was so far-fetched, but that's that's basically all you could do in 1986, 1987. Just kind of guess what would be what would work in a pinch, because the last thing you wanted to do from a business point of view, it from both point of view. Number one, from Camp, Capital Candy's point of view, we didn't want to not make the sale, so we wanted to send them something. And from a, a store point of view, you don't want an empty shelf. Empty shelves look terrible. looks like you're going out of business. And so anything is better than nothing. Of course, the best idea is to have the product that your customer wants, but having a, a, <clears throat> something similar that can make it work really does help. So it's just one of those things where I was, that was my first introduction to work processes in job routines and how to create a job routine. And I, I can tell you again, Full disclosure, I own and operate the Standard Health and Rehab, the training site for executive housekeepers. And I'll tell you the first thing we do, any housekeeper I work, any administrator I work with, we're talking about how to create job routines. Here's the first thing we do. The first thing we do is we assess what it is we're doing. That's number one. What do we do? Does it work? Does it not work? How often are you doing it? One of my favorite questions that I learned a long time ago, because I have these preset notions. I tell you, I, when I walk into a nursing home, I think I know how many times you should clean an office. I think I know how many times you should clean a, a, a bathroom. I think I know how many times you should clean a resident room. I think I know how many times you should clean a hallway. I think I know how many times you should clean the front entrance. And here's the truth. I don't know any of those answers. I think I do. I always want to speak up and tout my expertise, always. But I learned something very valuable and it was, I was actually touring with another person who was also in sales and did the same thing that I was doing, helping people with their job routines, trying to figure out best practices. And they used a turn of phrase that I had never considered using that was completely a game changer for me. And we were walking through the building and we we're, and he was asking questions. He was the lead. And so he said, how many times do you clean this sitting room? And I think the administrator was like, I think they're in here every day, once a day or once every other day, whatever the answer was. And this guy, without mixing a mix, without missing a beat, said, is that enough? He didn't say, well, let's look at the job they're doing. It looks crappy in here. There's cobwebs. There's all kinds of dust. The floor looks terrible. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say, oh, it looks really great. He didn't say, no. He said, is that enough? Do you think, will you clean this once a day or once every other day? Is that fine with you? Is this, is that okay with you? Putting the onus on the administrator, putting the onus on the client to say, you know what? It is fine with me. This is, this is not a big point for me, or it's, I think they do a great job doing it once a day or once every other day. Instead of me going and telling you how much I think it is, you tell me what works for you. It is a game changer. So number one rule when we're working on job routines if you were to work with me, the first thing I would do is assess what you are currently doing. And then from there, we'd break it down further. And we'll do more of this right on the other side of this small break. <clears throat> breaks, breaks, breaks. Uh, right now, it is the only place to hear you. Uh, you mean the radio show isn't working? Hmm. Is that true, Miss India? Can you tell me if we are having issues? Uh, uh, Ah. 
Hmm. Yeah, India, I guess, um, thank you for that. But I guess he's saying that uh, the actual radio program isn't doing well. Uh, he said it's too distorted. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I think so, India. I think that's what the problem is. I think we're having a little bit of an internet issue for radio, but um, seems to be coming through fine for social, Facebook, YouTube, all that. So, <clears throat> um, all right. Well. Last segment of the day. We'll see if we can make it fun. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ralph Peterson radio program. I am your host still. I haven't gone anywhere. Ralph Peterson. And this is our last segment for today. And there's a lot. Of, there's a couple of things that are super fun just to get right out of the way because I think it's hilarious. And that is... Like last week, I was telling you about how New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire, was having this big debate over whether or not, <laughs> it makes me laugh just thinking about it, whether or not you should be allowed to have your animals, your pets, in, your, in the room with you when you're on a Zoom call doing official government business. If you're uh, doing official government business in the state of New Hampshire, you had better not have a cat in the background or a dog or nobody better bark. Nobody said anything about their kids running around, but who knows? They were just being a little PC about it, but they probably annoyed them just as much. Well, there's this great story about a lawyer. They're doing these trials. Now they're doing these trials virtually. So you have the, the lawyers on virtual on Zoom. You have the judge on Zoom. You have the defendants, the plaintiffs. Everybody is on a Zoom call. And this lawyer logged in and apparently he had on some type of a filter on a Zoom call where <laughs> he was a kitty cat. That's right. So he's a cat. You can just Google it if you go. The, the name of the article is lawyer gets stuck in cat filter mode during a Zoom trial. And the lawyer saying, I'm not a cat. <laughs> oh, technology. You know, technology is actually a great thing to talk about. And website development is a great thing to talk about, especially when I'm trying to figure out a way to how do you best explain a work process and how to break down work processes? I think another great way, great example of work process and breaking them down is actually with creating a website. If you go to your favorite website, and it probably doesn't matter what website you are going to go to, you have to know that when you're creating a website, there is a beginning and an end, and you have to come up with what they call a website map a map of how your how people get to different places on your website and more importantly how they get back does every page of a website have a home button 
Most of the time, the answer is yes. And why do they have a home button? Because the people who are creating that website are going, as they're creating their map, they're saying, okay, you start here. And then let's say you want to look at my products and my services that I'm offering. You're going to click this product or service tab, and you're going to go in this other website, this other page. Now, what if you want to go back to the home page? You need to have a home button there to bring you back, or you could expand even further. Let's say I offer three different services and each one of those service offerings that I have brings you to another page. So you click on one, you're like, oh, that sounds interesting. It brings you to a third page, which may also have another link in there that can be, give you more description or even a sign up page. And there you have a fourth page. Now all of a sudden you're four pages in to this website. How do you get back to each page? You could click your back button or there could be another subsequent bar on top, a little button that says home or another one that says sessions, another one that says products or services. I just think it's a smart idea. Again, trying to figure out how best to explain what a work process is. I write everything, everything down. When I'm doing a work process, when I'm doing a work study, when I'm trying to figure out job routines, Listen, when I'm trying to work out a job routine, I will write down everything from beginning to end. I just did this with a kitchen. We had two kitchens, a nursing home and two kitchens, and they wanted to figure out how to close one of the kitchens because they were, the buildings were on the same campus. And so they're right beside each other. Matter of fact, the doors from the kitchen, from one kitchen to the other building, the door is only 20 feet away. So you could easily travel between these two buildings only 20 feet 20 feet is not far when you're traveling it takes you know 60 seconds or less especially when you're pushing food maybe it takes two minutes but they want to close one kitchen and only open have one kitchen serve the food for both kitchens for both buildings and i remember sitting there with and you could ask people who were involved with me during that time because it looked like i was a mad scientist i had this huge board this, you, I took over this whole wall and I, all I had was post-it notes. And these post-it notes were breaking down every single job routine. Like they do this and then they do this. And they, for instance, if you look at a regular job routine in a kitchen, the kitchen operates like this. A, the night before food is to be made, food is pulled. In other words, you're taking breakfast out of the freezer for thawing. So it goes, everything goes in a cooler. So out of the freezer into a refrigerator, everything is counted and prepped the night before. The next morning when they come in, the first thing a cook does when they come into a kitchen is turn on all the stoves, right? So everything has to be preheated. So everything gets turned on, light gets turned on, stoves get turned on, everything gets, then next, everything gets taken out of the cooler. All the stuff that you're going to be making for breakfast comes out of the cooler, gets put on the counter. Then it's divided up and you start preparing food. What needs to cook the longest goes in first. What needs to cook the second longest goes in next, right? So you, you have this order of things and all the way down to, it comes out of the oven, gets put on your it gets put on your steam table and from the steam table, you're starting to divvy out the food. So then you have somebody who's bringing out the tray, somebody who's calling that is they're just defining what food this person needs. You know, we want, you know, a two egg sausage, whatever with toast. And then somebody's giving you that you're putting it on a tray, you're putting a lid on it. You're pouring the coffee, the juice, the water, whatever it is. But this whole idea is, is every single step in that process is written down. And then I do it for every one of the job routines. And then I do it for both buildings. And then I compare the two. And then I start merging. I'm like, okay, if we're only going to have one kitchen, then essentially all this is going to be having to be done twice as much. And so we just start merging job routines. Okay, so this person and this person have similar jobs. Let's move it all over here. And now it's going to expand the amount of time we need to have to do it because they were doing it for 80 residents. Now they're doing it for 160 residents or whatever the number is. My point is that closing that kitchen took an enormous amount of just understanding the job routines and the work processes. And the way that I understood it, I didn't go in understanding it. I didn't go in going, I know exactly what to do here. No, I knew, you know what I know? I know how to break down job routines. I know how to create work processes. I know how to streamline. I know how to look at the system as a whole and then 
break down these tiny little areas where you can improve upon, improve upon, improve upon, improve upon. And so before you know it, you're able to do it twice as much, provide twice as much food in a smaller kitchen, closing the other kitchen, which is in fact what we did. And not only that, but a testament to how important this is. You are not allowed, by the way, just so you know, in the state of New York, you're not allowed to disclose a kitchen in a nursing home and start using some other kitchen. You have to have an entire plan in place and with contingencies, with what goes wrong, what could possibly go wrong, and what you're going to do about it, what your backup plan is for everything from emergency, water supply, emergency, power supply, emergency, food supply. What if it's raining? What if it's snowing? What if there's a snowstorm? What if there's a tractor trailer that gets broke down in between these two buildings? And now there's very little room for you to go around out one door and in the other door with food on this big cart. Like you have to, you have to essentially come up with all these scenarios and then break down each one of the issues that you could potentially be addressing or running into and solving the issue. Then you have to take all of that and put it in a report and give it to the Department of Health. And the Department of Health, DOH, they are the ones who essentially give you the thumbs up or the thumbs down. They are the ones who say either this makes sense, go ahead and close the kitchen, you can just use one kitchen, or there's no chance that this is going to work. We're never going to give you approval because we are not convinced that you're going to be able to do any of this successfully, safely for the, for the residents. And so you get shut down and you're not able to do it. They had that happen for 10 years. And this is not me touting my own, my own abilities. What I am touting is the ability, the power of breaking down job routines, breaking down work processes to their smallest element. I, because I broke down every work process and we were able to work, once you break down every work process, you're able to see it in a whole new light. I'm telling you, you'll be able to see how you do things. You'll be like, oh, like, oh, that doesn't make sense. Or that does make sense. Or, oh, we're, you know what? We could use another person here, or we could use a longer counter space, or we could use more cups or more plates or more equipment or whatever it is, or less of all that. And you take all that into consideration when you break down these work processes, and then you can easily start seeing how to proactively solve problems, make things more efficient, more effective, better, smarter, cheaper. And by the way, and cheaper sometimes just simply means you get to make more money doing it because the price doesn't go down, but the cost does. And boy, I'll tell you what, there's no other place. One of the biggest places where I see a lot of cost spending unnecessarily is in housekeeping people how do you clean a dirty building there's two ways number one you can add more staff <laughs> which a lot of people do a lot of people are just like ah what does add more staff that is crazy talk or you can get a better system you can break down all your work processes break them down into the smallest elements come up with a plan figure out where all your staff are what they're doing how often they should be doing what they're doing and come up with a streamlined job routine that saves you both time and money and makes you more effective, more effective, more efficient. Is there anything better than being more effective and efficient in business? The answer, of course, is no. It's a rhetorical question. I wasn't really asking you. I know the answer. This has been fun. Thank you so much for allowing me some space in your day to share everything I know about work processes, and I hope this has been helpful to you. I will see you next week right here on the Ralph Peterson radio program. Have a great day. Stay safe out there. I know the snow is getting crazy. <clears throat>